Good morning and good evening wherever you are in the world. My name is Paul Miles and I'm joined uh, by an audience here at Monash University in Melbourne. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet here, the Boon people, um, the coastal tribe of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to them, their culture and their elders past, present and future. The format of today is I'll give a very brief introduction followed by Karen Golding, who's the manager of the ANSI Clinical Trials Network. We'll talk about how and why we achieved uh, this massive trial uh, on time and on budget, and most particularly the importance of our research coordinators. Trish Beale is a ID physician here at Monash and at the Alfred Hospital, and she'll talk about the importance of surgical site infection. And then, of course, the star of the show, Thomas Corcoran, uh, we'll talk about the rationale design and give the main results. And following that, there'll be a panel discussion with questions and answer. And I encourage everybody online to send in their questions uh, via the chat function. So the ANSCA Clinical Trials Network began as the master trial group back in the mid-1990s with our first publication in The Lancet in 2002. And since that time, we've grown and built up to a much more extensive trial network across Australia, New Zealand, and part of our region. And we've been very successful in recruiting more than 25,000 surgical patients to randomised trials in our field. I'd like to now ask Karen to come forward and give us a bit of a background about the importance of the research team. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, for the introduction. I've been with ANSCA since 2014, and in that time I've witnessed substantial growth in the diversity and number of trials that we run. PADI broke new ground. It allowed us to run trials at hospital sites that had never run trials before, and also brought back sites that recruited to earlier studies. We believe PADI was instrumental in the evolution of the ANSCA CTN. The ANSCA CTN is one of the most successful networks in anaesthesia, pain, and perioperative medicine in the world. It's a collaboration of national and international hospitals, site investigators, fellows, trainees and research coordinators that come together to conduct high quality trials. The success of the ANSCA CTN is underpinned by our Anesthesia Research Coordinators Network or ARCAN. They're in they are a network of more than 160 research coordinators facilitating anaesthesia research across New Zealand and Australia. They drive patient recruitment by screening, consenting and completing timely data follow-up. Our data from the PADI trial shows that sites with a full-time research coordinator recruited on average five times many more patients than sites without a research coordinator. And this emphasises that research coordinators are vital, vital to the sustainability of research departments. The ARCAN come together monthly for in-service sessions for networking, education and career development opportunities. We also run virtual and face-to-face -face workshops. And in March this year, we've run our, we ran our second ARCAN virtual workshop with more than 80 participants online. The leadership group for the ARCAN is the ARCAN subcommittee and it has regional representation across Australia and New Zealand and it's chaired by Miss Alison Kearney from Princess Alexandra Hospital in Queensland. Every year we run our CTN strategic research workshop to develop new ideas for high quality trials. We also administer the ANSCA pilot grant scheme to fund feasibility and pilot studies that may lead to Fund, funded high quality trials. This scheme is funded by the ANSCA Research Foundation, which we're truly grateful for. We have a dedicated CTN office supported by both Monash University and the college, and Julian Orman and I are working together to support fellows, trainees, research coordinators, and clinical trial investigators deliver high quality trials. The CTN has an excellent brand and track record in securing major funding, such as the NHMRC and Medical Research Future Fund, and also, as Paul mentioned, delivering our trials on time and within budget. Um, 
the, the, we have a strong leadership via the CTN executive and that's chaired by Professor Andrew Davidson. So on this slide shows all the current trials that we're running. They will recruit 28,000 patients over the next five years. The majority of these trials have been funded by the MRFF and NHMRC. They will answer important perioperative medicine questions such as whether anaesthetic techniques influence cancer reoccurrence, whether tranexamic acid reduces surgical site infections, and whether lidocaine or ketamine reduces chronic post-surgical pain. We encourage you to get in contact with us at the office to learn how your site can become involved in our trials. Moving on to Patty. Paddy was a huge collaboration of 55 hospital sites across Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, and South Africa. Behind each hospital is a team of dedicated site investigators, fellows, trainees, and research coordinators that worked hard to recruit to the trial. And some of these sites did so without the invaluable support of our research coordinators. Looking at the slide, there were a number of hospital sites that were established but there were 18 brand new sites that came on board the CTN with the PADI trial, and these are underlined. We've been showcasing all our PADI teams on Twitter, so please check out our PADI Twitter feed. We thank all the teams for the hard work recru recruiting to PADI, and a special thank you to the new sites that came on board to get trials started and to build a research culture. Thank you for your attention, and I'm gonna hand you back over to Paul. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Karen. Um, I'd now like to introduce Trisha Peel, who's an infectious diseases physician here at uh, Monash University and Alfred Hospital. Trisha is uh, a council member of the Australasian Society of Infectious Diseases and a member of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons Joint Working Group for Antibiotic Prophylaxis. And she's going to talk to us about the importance uh, and cost of surgical site infection. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning and good evening, depending on where you are in the world. So I'm really uh, excited to be here today to present uh, on why surgical site infections are, are an important area of clinical practice. I'm also really excited to see the results of the, the PADI trial. I guess one of my mentors once told me you should study what you see. And I think, you know, sometimes looking at some of the simplest questions and answering those questions can have a very profound impact on our practice. So I think the PADI trial really encapsulates that well. So I'm going to talk about why postoperative infections are the most important area of clinical medicine. And as always, we begin with uh, some numbers. So talking about how many surgery procedures are performed each year in the world, and it's actually quite hard to get a uh, good estimate of the amount of surgery that's performed. It's thought that there's maybe over 300 million surgeries performed each year. If you look at high income countries, one procedure per 10 people is performed each year. Of these surgeries, unfortunately, about five to 20% of patients will develop a post-operative infection, including a surgical site infection. Those in the area know that these infections have devastating complications for patients. They frequently require readmission to surgery, uh, repeat surgery. Uh, they also need to have prolonged courses of antimicrobial therapy, uh, and they cause a lot of suffering for the patients, reduce quality of life, and in some cases, uh, carry a mortality risk. These infections are also uh, costly. So we know, again, that for each infection, on average, it costs US $20,000 to treat these infections. So when you think about the numbers, we're talking around about 6 million infections a year and $123 billion. That's in the high income countries alone. And the reason why it's another area we're really interested in is we know that a lot of these infections can be prevented. So data from a meta-analysis suggested that over half of all these infections can be pre prevented through the application of evidence-based strategies. And these strategies include things such as surgical antimicrobial prophylaxis, skin preparations, surgical scrub, uh, and also uh, good wound care. 
But the other thing we need to focus on is how can we optimise the patient to try to prevent them getting surgical site infections? And we think about what are the risk factors for patients undergoing surgery. Surgical site infections occur at the nexus of the patient, the bug, and the operation itself. So when we think about the patient, there are some uh, non-modifiable factors, such as increasing age, despite the fact that quite a few people would like it to be modifiable. Uh, other things such as smoking, diabetes, obesity, and uh, immunosuppression. When we think about the microbiology, we think about colonization with resistant organisms. So for example, colonization with methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus increases your risk of surgical site infection. And then there are wound contamination at the time of surgery and our infection prevention approaches such as surgical antimicrobial prophylaxis can reduce the risk of infection. The operation itself has a number of factors that may contribute to your risk of surgical site infection. So longer procedures, uh, higher wound classification and tissue trauma all increase your risk. Uh, maintaining normal temperature uh, can potentially reduce risk of infection. Uh, good blood control uh, can also reduce your risk of infection. Simple things such as airflow and air exchange in the theatre and the number of times the door opens into the theatre and theatre traffic actually can also increase your risk of surgical site infection. But for the purposes of today's talk, I'm really going to be focusing on the role of immunosuppression in surgical site infections. So the simple question is, does immunosuppression increase your risk of surgical site infection? And so this is a meta-analysis looking in joint arthroplasty surgery, which does suggest that the use of steroids uh, increases the risk of surgical site infection. But this is people who are already on established courses of steroids. And the question always is, is it the chicken or the egg? Is it that the patient is on the steroids and that increases their risk of surgical site infection, or is it the underlying immuno uh, condition that uh, has necessitated the steroid therapy? And I think it's probably uh, a little bit of both. So this is another study, a large uh, cohort study, in again in joint replacement surgery, which looked at risk factors for surgical site infection. And they found that the perioperative use of prednisolone increased the risk of surgical site infection as did having a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis compared to osteoarthritis. But as I said, this is for patients who are on pre-existing doses. And the question came, should you, be, should you be stopping or reducing their immunosuppression prior to surgery? And this is a guideline recommendation from the WHO, which suggested that you shouldn't discontinue immunosuppression medication prior to surgery. Uh, for purely the purposes of preventing surgical site infection. And this decision was made on balance of the fact that you may cause adverse harms to the patient, such as flare of their immune condition if you reduce their immunosuppression, uh, balanced against the fact that there isn't great data to show that there is an increased risk of surgical site infection. But as I was saying, this, these papers focus on therapy that people are already on, so established therapy. But really for the focus of today's talk, it's whether giving a single dose of uh, dexamethasone uh, at the time of surgery actually increases your risk of infection. And there are some arguments for using dexamethasone in this setting. For example, it's an uh, excellent anti-nausea and anti-emetic. And we know for en enhanced recovery after surgery program, ERAS programs or early mobilization programs, where you're trying to get the patient up and moving and out of hospital, having good control and anti-nausea effect uh, is very important for these patients. Against are the theoretical risks of poor glycemic control, so particularly in our diabetics. There's concerns about whether steroids impair wound healing and, of course, whether it increases the risk of surgical site infection. There's been a number of reviews looking at the use of dexamethasone in this setting. And this is a Cochrane review, which was published in 2018. Uh, in one of their tables, which is illustrated here, they compared a single dose of dexamethasone uh, to, uh, to see what the impact was on post-operative systemic or surgical site infections. And the, uh, the conclusion of this analysis was that there was, didn't appear to be any increased risk with a single dose of dexamethasone. They also looked at wound healing, and again, in this study, they found that there was no difference in uh, use of single dose of dexamethasone for delayed wound healing, but noted that it was quite wide confidence interval, so there was a lot of imprecision. 
the authors concluded that there probably was no increased risk with the use of dexamethasone uh, as a single dose in the perioperative setting. Uh, but in a wonderful sort of herald for, for the PADI trial, they did note that this trial, these trials had all excluded patients with diabetes and also had excluded patients with immunosuppression. And so they couldn't def draw definitive conclusions in that setting as to whether dexamethasone was potentially beneficial, benefit or beneficial or potentially harmful. And so uh, as a sort of uh, signaling and signposting what was on the horizon, they actually noted that the uh, reporting of the PADI trial would be an important trial uh, to add to this evidence. So I think on that note, it's a nice way to lead into the next bit. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Trish. I think that really was a wonderful background to why, why this trial was being done. It's uh, my great pleasure now to, to introduce Thomas Corcoran, the principal investigator of the PADI trial. Thomas is a trained intensive care physician and anesthesiologist. Uh, he's head of research at Royal Perth Hospital and an adjunct professor here at Monash University. Um, before actually um, allowing Thomas to speak, I just wanted to give some in the audience a very gentle overview of what the hell is a non-inferiority trial. So this is what I would describe as the lay version of it. So the concern has been for many, many years in clinical practice that um, steroids or dexamethasone could increase the risk of surgical site and other infections. And that's the whole reason why the PADI trial was designed and run. And it's designed as a non-inferiority trial. And that in simple terms mean is, is it just as safe as not using dexamethasone in our practice. That's the question that's actually being addressed by the trial. And just as safe uh, is being defined by what's known as a delta margin of no more than an, an increased risk of 2% over and above the placebo or control group. So that's what it, that's what it is. Uh, it can be um, depicted here in this diagram where the uh, black line which I think is this one here, vertical line here is zero difference between groups. The delta margin is set as plus 2% above that. And if the 95% confidence interval does not cross that delta margin, then we can claim non-inferiority, or in other words, just as safe as not using steroids. However, if the 95% confidence interval crosses this delta margin, we have inconclusive results. And if the point estimate 95% uh, margins all sit above that line, then in fact, inferiority is demonstrated or in fact harm with respect to surgical site infection. So that's, I hope, softened the blow for what's to come next. So I'll now introduce Thomas Corcoran. Thanks, uh, Paul, and uh, thanks, uh, Trish, for a, um, a really wonderful uh, discussion that I could never have articulated myself. And welcome to everybody online and uh, in person, uh, wherever you are. Uh, I can confirm that none of the uh, co-investigators have any conflicts of interest to declare, and the PADI trial uh, received funding from a number of sources, the National Health Medical Research Council of Australia, the Research Grant Council of Hong Kong, and our pilot trial was funded by the Medical Research Foundation of Royal Perth Hospital. Um, I must acknowledge the team that it took to put this trial together and to deliver it. Obviously, all of my co-investigators on the steering committee, many of whom will be well known to you. Um, but I must acknowledge the assistance from the CTN office, from Ms. Karen Golding, uh, from Jaspeet Sidhu, who was the trial manager, and from Pauline Coots, my trial manager in Western Australia. I also think it's important to acknowledge the contribution of the volunteers, the members of the Data and Safety Monitoring Committee and the Endpoint Adjudication Committee, uh, who are responsible for helping maintain the integrity of the trial and ensuring that it was delivered to the highest possible standard. So this trial is the result of a 10-year line of investigation, which has spawned a number of clinical trials, uh, meta-analysis, um, surveys of practice, uh, a pilot trial, and ultimately the PADI trial, the results of which I'm going to present to you this morning. So why did we pursue this line of investigation in the first instance? Well, after a four-year hiatus from anesthesia practice, when I spent time working in intensive care, where coincidentally glucocorticoid use based on the work of Dejili Annan 
uh, was being uh, toyed, uh, pl played around with in, in a number of small trials. Um, I came back to full-time anesthesia in 2007, and what I noticed was that in that intervening period, there was widespread administration uh, or had been a change of practice such that glucocorticoids were being administered widely, uh, not just by anesthetists, but also by the surgeons in the perioperative period for some of the reasons that uh, Tricia has mentioned earlier on, particularly as a component of ERAS protocols. Um, and there seemed to be good evidence supporting a lot of this practice, um, but there was a bit of discord in the literature and some individuals were expressing concern that perhaps we hadn't established uh, the full safety of such a practice. Now, we know that uh, post-operative nose vomiting is a major problem in uh, anesthesia and perioperative care. It can uh, affect up to 80% up to of patients, depending upon their risk profile. Um, and we do know that it can be quite problematic uh, in terms of anxiety for patients if they have experienced it before. And we use dexamethasone in anesthesia quite widely. Uh, as an anti-emetic, uh, for which it appears to be quite effective. But there are other indications. It's used for a proposed improvement in post-operative analgesia. It is said to improve uh, quality of recovery. It appears to have an established place in ear, nose and throat and maxillofacial surgery to reduce uh, facial swelling and improve sore throat. Uh, and it has also been demonstrated to decrease the risk of respiratory complications in patients undergoing cardiac surgery. Now, this has been extensively addressed elsewhere, and I'm not going to talk about the use of dexamethasone in cardiac surgery any further. So as an anti-emetic, uh, dexamethasone uh, is highly effective. Numbers needed to treat of between <clears throat> uh, four and seven for early and late nausea and vomiting. And it appears to be particularly efficacious for post-discharge nausea and vomiting in ambulatory anesthesia, which can be problematic because patients leave a facility and then uh, require readmission because of intractable vomiting. Uh, and this is perhaps due to its uh, prolonged uh, half-life and, and uh, effect. Uh, it also is effective against intrathecal uh, opioid-induced uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting. Um, so it is very commonly administered. Our most recent estimates based on examination of its use in previous CTN trials and our recent survey of the fellowship suggests that up to 50% of patients may receive a single dose of dexamethasone as part of their routine general anesthetic. And although numerous meta-analyses, including one that we published, uh, performed and published in 2017, have asserted the safety of the use of dexamethasone, there has been a nagging suspicion amongst many individuals, not just in anesthesia, but in the infectious disease and in the endocrinology community, um, that we have not fully established its safety and that it is not without potential risks. Uh, as Trish has alluded to, one of the major risks of, post -op of, of surgery is post-operative surgical site infection. And because Dexamethasone is a very potent glucocorticoid. Um, giving it in the perioperative period might not necessarily seem to be a good idea, particularly if you are worried about uh, a patient developing a surgical site infection. There are other risks that have been purported. Uh, there is biological plausibility due to its effect on collagen synthesis that it may impair uh, wound uh, healing, uh, may promote an asthmatic leak and an asthmatic breakdown. And then there is the potential effect, uh, because it is a potent glucocorticoid, uh, on gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis and may therefore provoke hyperglycemia in the perioperative period, which can in itself or has believed in itself to contribute to surgical site infection risk. And lastly, uh, perhaps most tenuously, uh, some individuals have proposed a possible increased risk of cancer recurrence uh, if it's given during surgery for primary resection. So it's against this background that we decided to pursue the uh, PADI trial. Uh, effectively, the hypothesis we were testing was whether the use of dexamethasone 8 milligrams in adult patients undergoing uh, non-urgent, non-cardiac surgery would increase the risk of surgical site infection mm -hmm. after surgery. We chose a dose of 8 milligrams for reasons uh, that it was, if we were likely to observe a benefit, um, and this was the dose with which, or sorry, if we were likely to observe uh, an increased risk, that this was the dose with which uh, we were going to show it, um, given that some individuals do use doses of two and four milligrams as an antiemetic also. And as Paul has indicated, it is a non-inferior trial. So PADI was a large trial, almost 9,000 patients recruited, uh, multi-center, pragmatic, international, triple-blinded, um, 
uh, study with uh, patients randomized to receive either their dose of dexamethasone or placebo, match placebo very shortly after the induction of anesthesia. Uh, we stratified group allocation by diabetes status. We were very keen to ensure that we had balance across the groups for patients with diabetes because of the fact uh, that nobody had done a trial of this size in patients with diabetes before. And we also stratified it according to randomization site. And the study was sponsored by Alfred Health uh, and the trial protocol uh, was registered in an openly available clinical trials registry before we started recruitment. So we included adult patients, ASA 1 to 4, undergoing elective or expedited non-cardiac surgery. Uh, we recruited patients where they were likely to have a, a general anesthesia duration of at least two hours with one overnight stay uh, because we wanted to capture intermediate or major surgical procedures. Uh, and we also mandated a minimal um, surg uh, surgical incision of five centimeters. Uh, there are a number of important exclusions I will mention, the first of which is that we did not recruit patients with unstable diabetes as uh, defined by an HbA1c of greater than 9%. The reason for this was because these individuals are commonly believed to be at increased risk of uh, post-operative surgical site infection, and therefore we did not feel that if we were testing this hypothesis, it was probably ethical to include those patients. We also excluded patients who had had surgery uh, uh, been treated for infection or received glucocorticoid therapy prior to the index surgical procedure. And we also um, uh, excluded patients where glucocorticoids were likely to be used in the post-operative period or where planned surgery was to occur within 30 days of the index procedure. And so the primary endpoint of this trial was to examine whether um, dexamethasone had an influence on surgical site infection risk and surgical site infection as defined by the CDC criteria, being either a superficial, uh, deep or organ space infection uh, at 30 days. We collected a number of other secondary endpoints that we felt were important. We examined each of these individual infections uh, as a separate entity uh, on its own. Uh, rather than the whole group, and we also examined deeper organ space infections in patients with prostheses implanted uh, at 90 days because this is actually a separate subtype of a surgical site infection, and it does capture those patients, for example, with uh, prosthetic infections. Uh, we examined other infections up to 30 days, and then we collected data around quality of recovery, chronic post-surgical pain, and new onset disability or death at six months. And Paul has uh, taken us through the, the possible outcomes and the design issues around design issues around a non-inferiority trial. But fundamentally, based on our data from previous trials, uh, the surgical site infection rate was 9% in the Enigma 2 study. The steering committee, uh, aided and abetted by our intensive uh, infection, infectious disease physicians who, who had the, the casting vote in this week, thought that 2% was the acceptable non-inferiority margin. And in order to have 90% power, we needed to recruit uh, 4,400 patients per group um, according to uh, our analysis, and that would account for 3% of uh, loss to follow-up. Now, the primary outcome, we plan to analyze it in the modified intention to treat, the per protocol and the as-treated populations. Uh, the reasons behind this are, are a bit complex, but uh, effectively some regulatory agencies and certainly the most recent consort statement around reporting of non-inferiority trials uh, do mandate that you need to see a similar result in at least two of these three populations in order for the result to be considered a definitive result. Nonetheless, the result in the modified intention to treat population was considered the primary result. So after uh, screening provision of informed consent, uh, patients were then randomized uh, according to the diabetes or non-diabetes stratum and then into a placebo or dexamethasone group. They were followed up on days one, two, and three on day of discharge, and then at days 30 and at six months when the study period uh, was defined as completed. All other aspects of surgical and post-operative care were according to usual practice, uh, as I've mentioned, um, patients were excluded from receiving uh, any glucocorticoid therapy for one month after the surgical procedure. But the management of blood glucose and the management of diabetes and other medications in the perioperative period was left at the discretion of the individual physicians and the individual sites, and we did not actually mandate any, any change in practice there. Wound assessments and leading questions were performed at discharge on day 30 and at six months. 
uh, and all reported primary endpoints needed to be supported by source documentation. And then they were forwarded to the independent endpoint adjudication committee where they were validated uh, or otherwise by a group of independent uh, blinded experts. And so to the results. Um, the, uh, we recruited 8,880 patients. We commenced recruitment in March of 2016 and we completed in July of 2019 with the final follow-up being complete in February 2020. And just to give you a little bit of idea of the, 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 the background of these patients, of the baseline demographics, and as you'd expect, uh, in a trial of the size, we achieved excellent balance uh, across both groups. Patients uh, had a mean age of 59. Uh, slightly more males were recruited than females. Patients were predominantly ASA 2 and 3. 16% uh, or thereabouts were current smokers. And we did achieve our median duration of surgery of about two and a half hours. So we were quite pleased with that. Of interest, um, approximately one in three patients uh, at the time of randomization reported uh, experiencing chronic pain. Uh, and overall, the diabetes stratum represented about 13% of the entire cohort. Uh, the surgery was predominantly clean or clean contaminated, um, and um, synthetic or material or metal was uh, in, implanted in just over a third of patients, and gastrointestinal and orthopedic surgical procedures were the principal procedure groups. Uh, of interest, uh, almost 80% of patients received at least one antiemetic outside of study drug during the procedure. Uh, and the protocol breach rate, I'll mention it here, but the protocol breach rate uh, was a little bit over 6% across both groups. And I'll come back to that, talk to that later on. So the primary outcome, surgical site infection, what do we find? Well, in the placebo group, 9.1% uh, of patients experience a surgical site infection. That's 394 individual episodes of surgical site infection. In the dexamethasone group, 8.1% of patients experience a surgical site infection. Uh, that's 354 individual episodes. Now, as Paul has, uh, has alluded to earlier on, these uh, single point estimates don't necessarily tell the whole story in a non-inferiority trial. And I've just outlined two possible outcomes here. You can have the treatment as harmful, where your confidence intervals, uh, both ends of the confidence intervals of the point estimate of the difference between groups is above the 2% margin, or you can get the the uh, result of the treatment being non-inferior, where the upper end of the confidence interval lies below that 2% non-inferiority margin. So when we examine the result in the modified intention to treat group, the confidence interval around the difference between the two groups lies between minus 2.1 to plus 0.3%. And that is a, a clear non-inferiority uh, result. The p-value for that non-inferiority result is highly significant at less than 0 0.001. And when we examine the per-protocol and as-treated populations, we get an identical result in the per-protocol uh, group or per-protocol population. The confidence interval is exactly the same. In the as-treated uh, population, there is a very slight difference in the point estimate towards zero, but nonetheless, the confidence interval still lies, the upper end of the confidence interval still lies below that 2% non-inferiority margin. And that again is a non-inferiority result. So this is a robust finding across these three patient populations. And just to highlight, because we did stratify according to diabetes status, when we examined for any interaction of diabetes with the treatment, there was no evidence of an interaction in that diabetes subgroup. And again, non-inferiority uh, was clear. And when we examined uh, all of the individual subgroups, we created a, a list of factors that are widely uh, spoken of and believed to contribute to increased surgical site infection risk. I won't go into in each of these individuals ex except to say uh, that the p-values of interaction for each of these subgroups are non-significant. Now, there are a number of secondary outcomes, uh, three, in fact, that are worth pointing out. Firstly, uh, in reassuringly, when we examined the incidence of each of these individual surgical site infections considered separately, uh, there was no difference between the groups in terms of the risk. I will point out that the quality of recovery score on day one uh, was significantly different between the two groups in favor of dexamethasone, and also, uh, at six months, 7.1% of patients in the placebo group complained or reported uh, experiencing chronic post-surgical pain, uh, as opposed to 8.7% of patients in the dexamethasone group. 
Now, the p-value around that finding is uh, 0 0.006, and I must emphasize that none of the p-values for these secondary outcomes are corrected for multiplicity. And there are a number of other uh, tertiary outcomes that I think are, are, are just worth uh, highlighting. First of all, uh, nausea or vomiting and any anti-medic usage uh, at 24 hours was uh, significantly lower in patients who've been received dexamethasone. There was a small but statistically significant uh, improvement in uh, rest pain at 24 hours amongst those who received dexamethasone. And there was an, uh, an increase in blood glucose, uh, maximum blood glucose across both groups. Um, but insulin usage uh, in patients without diabetes was also increased in those who'd received dexamethasone. Uh, reassuringly, again, none of the pre-specified safety endpoints, including unexpected reoperation at 30 days and unexpected readmission to hospital at 30 days, neither of those were um, uh, different between the groups. So the major findings of, of the PADI trial is that in patients undergoing non-urgent, non-cardiac surgery of intermediate or greater severity, a single dose of intravenous dexamethasone is non-inferior compared to placebo, so it is not associated with an increased risk of surgical site infection. It demonstrates no increased risk in patients with diabetes, and it does not increase the risk in patients who have had the synthetic material implanted. It may be associated with a small increase in the risk of chronic post-surgical pain, and that is a, a, an outcome that we will uh, need to look at in, in further studies. Uh, some minor findings are that we have reaffirmed the anti-emetic efficacy or effectiveness of, uh, of dexamethasone, uh, and we've also identified that it is associated, which is a finding that others have made, that it is associated with a small increase in maximum blood glucose concentration in all patients and insulin use in patients without diabetes. So to conclude, uh, the clinical implications of the findings of the PADI trial and I, I think these are pretty definitive uh, based on, on, on the analysis that we have performed, is that dexamethasone, 8 milligrams, may be safely administered as an effective antiemetic in all patients undergoing non-urgent, non-cardiac surgery without concern for surgical site infection risk. This is particularly the case in patients with diabetes, patients with implanted prosthetic material, or patients who are otherwise considered to be at an increased risk of surgical site infection. Therefore, concern relating to surgical site infection is not a reason not to give uh, dexamethasone to your patients if it is clinically indicated. And thank you for your, uh, your attendance and your audience. And if you would like to see further details, the paper has just been uploaded to the New England Journal of Medicine online uh, within the last hour. So you can access the paper there and the appendix and look through the details. Uh, and I would like to uh, conclude by saying that we have a podcast which is available today, Paul. Um, which was recorded yesterday, uh, which will uh, perhaps answer some further questions you may have around this, uh, these results. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Thomas, and congratulations on a fantastic achievement. I think a very important trial that should have a big impact around the world. Now, we're actually on time, which astonishes, astonishes me at least, so there's quite a bit of time now for some question and discussion with our panel. We're just going to flip the cameras um, towards the panel busy, but bringing a big dose of science to what is otherwise a difficult topic. Now, I might just start, if I can, uh, with a question of my own. First to Alan and perhaps Trish might also answer. How do you think the results of this trial will actually affect um, uh, infectious diseases physicians and perhaps non anaesthesia clinicians who deal with surgical patients. Yeah, look, I'd probably just start off by congratulating um, Tom and uh, you for this uh, amazing trial. It's uh, really quite an achievement. I, I think infectious diseases physicians in general have metaphorical antibodies to steroids. We generally don't like them in under any circumstances unless we really absolutely have to. And I think this is um, to some extent, um, you know, challenges that, um, you know, that uh, frame of thinking that, um, you know, we do use steroids in TB, you know, where, you know, swelling is bad. And I guess there is this consideration perhaps that, you know, we're giving um, prophylactic antibiotics at the time of surgery. So maybe steroids aren't sort of the, the boogeyman that we, um, that we think it is. And um, there is, even though this is a non-inferiority trial, there is that tantalising uh, possibility that maybe it is beneficial. But 
that's not quite supported, you know, conclusively by this evidence. But um, I think we can at least stop worrying about, um, you know, single doses of steroids. I might um, see if Patricia has any uh, opinion on that. Uh, I guess from my background, working a lot with surgery and also with early mobilisation and ERAS programs, I think one of the biggest barriers for enhanced recovery is getting patients up and out of bed and making sure they're not nauseous and vomiting, et cetera. And we know that if you're able to actually get patients out of hospital, they're less likely to have all the attendant risks of prolonged hospitalisation, so DVT, PE, but also hospital-acquired infection. So I think from that background as well, being able to support those programs, I think it is important. Uh, so I think it, it will help uh, reassure um, perhaps the infectious diseases, but I think also some of our surgical colleagues who have that concern about using steroids in that setting as well. Uh, thanks. And I might just ask uh, Thomas a question. You, you, you're also trained in intensive care medicine and you have a real, I guess, better understanding of the implications of more extensive surgery, particularly the inflammatory response that follows. Is perioperative or post-operative inflammation or the inflammatory state of itself harmful or potentially harmful or of itself might induce an immune suppression? That's a very pertinent question in this field, Paul, I guess, because um, the simple answer is we don't know. I don't think we know enough about uh, perioperative inflammation. I know that uh, some colleagues in the audience, including Chris Bain, are doing further work on it. Clearly, inflammation is necessary to promote proper uh, wound healing um, and return to function. Uh, and we do know that there are a subgroup of individuals who just seem to be prone to getting a deranged inflammatory response. So it may be that in some individuals, they benefit from the use of glucocorticoids, or, and it may be in other individuals that um, it may be deleterious. And I don't think we've gone anywhere, anywhere near being able to define who the subgroups are. But thinking of the ping pong that happened with glucocorticoids in 2003, 2004, when I was doing intensive care, we were giving... Uh, doses of glucocorticoids to patients with profound septic shock. And I'm not entirely convinced that the uh, intensive care community has has actually come to terms even with the immunology of uh, sepsis. So we face the same challenge and they're probably a little bit further down the road than we are, although I think we are catching up rapidly with these sorts of studies. So we know inflammation is necessary. We know it is part of the body's response to trauma. We know that it promotes healing, but at some point, um, it becomes deranged in a subgroup of individuals, and I'm, I'm making the assumption, uh, maybe erroneously, but that, that may also contribute to the risk of surgical site infection. Uh, thank you for that. We've got a question now regarding um, uh, uncontrolled diabetes. Um, so someone here has asked on the chat, um, we in, excluded patients with HbA1c uh, over 9% because obviously they are expected to have unstable and difficult treat diabetes in the perioperative setting. Um, but uh, irrespective of that, there were certainly a lot of people with diabetes and high-ish HbA1Cs that otherwise were in there, uh, certainly a smaller subgroup that perhaps would have had poorly controlled diabetes. Um, what, what does the data show in terms of that really, if you like, more high-risk subgroup of that subgroup? Is the... Is there a fairly consistent finding or is there some signals that might keep us a bit more cautious about um, unstable diabetes at least? Yeah, I, again, um, the literature is a little bit unclear. The most recent meta-analysis, I think, was by Rollins some years ago, uh, which I don't think identified a relationship between HbA1c and, and surgical site infection risk, but it wasn't based, you know, there aren't many trials in this field. Um, and it wasn't just the risk of surgical site infection in diabetes and the expectation that poorly controlled uh, diabetes would contribute to a higher risk. It was also the risk of perioperative hyperglycemia, which we felt might just um, cause greater difficulty in those patients in the perioperative period and therefore compromise the trial. Um, so uh, in, in, in short, no, we don't know what the actual answer is, but we, it seemed sensible that given the uh, suggestion that might, be, might contribute to increased risk, that we would just contaminate the findings and we were only likely to have a relatively small number of patients, so therefore it would have been inconclusive anyway. 
So um, many in the audience may not be aware that there is a planned further deeper analysis around glycemic control and diabetes. Uh, working with Leon Bach, one of our co-investigators on the PADI trial, who's an endocrinologist. Um, so can you just tell us a little bit about what you're anticipating that analysis or that extra data might be able to tell us? I think it'll it'll clarify um, uh, the relationship between dexamethasone and the extent of hyperglycemia, potentially the duration, because as with many of these trials, we do collect a lot of additional data. And we do have planned sub-studies, as you've alluded to, and they have statistical analysis plans, which have been published online before the analysis is performed. So it's, it's a very transparent examination of the data. Um, the key issues we're going to be looking at is excursions and blood glucose, the maximum change, um, insulin usage, uh, and then the relationship between that, the interaction with HbA1c and, and, and outcomes. In the PADAG trial, which was a precursor and pilot for PADI, we did indicate that there was an interaction. We did find in about 350 to 400 patients that there was an interaction in all patients between HbA1c and the dose of the exomethasone with the highest post-operative blood glucose concentration. And that probably, you know, sort of it's biologically plausible. It makes sense to me that the poorer your glycemic control um, the higher the dose of dexamethasone, the more likely you are to experience uh, extreme blood glucose excursions. But hopefully the work that Leon uh, will be doing will highlight that a bit further. Right. So that's obviously uh, to come. Hopefully later this year we'll have a lot more detail around that area. Um, uh, in critical care, at least, steroids are, have been shown to improve hemodynamic control. In the PADI trial, was there any data collected around hypotension or blood pressure? to look at that aspect? Uh, no. Okay. Um, one of the experts on the consensus guidelines group, uh, which had previously recommended um, four milligrams of dexamethasone as an antiemetic dose to be used intraoperatively. Are you suggesting that we now should or could safely use eight milligrams in preference? And what would be the advantage of the slightly higher dose? Uh, well, I think we've shown fairly conclusively in terms of surgical site infection risk that dexamethasone eight at a dose of eight milligrams is safe. Um, there has been some work saying that that is a more effective dose uh, and works for, uh, you know, we don't tend to dose on per kilo basis in adults. Now the recommendation uh, by the uh, group led by Tongan is that now in pediatrics is 0.15 milligrams per kilogram. And there have been some concerns around bleeding in paediatrics related to dexamethasone, but that's since not been proven. Um, so we don't tend to dose on a weight basis in adults. We usually choose, some people will just pick whichever vial is in the drawer. Um, and I know my own institution, we only keep four milligram vials. Um, but I think we can safely say that uh, dexamethasone at eight milligrams is an effective antiemetic. Um, it does not have an increased risk of surgical site infection, and it probably will give you a better antiemetic effect and probably longer duration of action as well. And that higher dose, so the data that would support its analgesic benefit and perhaps improvement in quality of recovery, is that is enough data there to show that as an extra benefit at the higher uh, dose? There is some data, but probably not enough to say definitively. Okay. All right. Now, what about um, post-operative delirium? Um, we know delirium is correlated with probably the extent of infl inflammation after surgery, particularly neuroinflammation. Is it likely that dexamethasone would be beneficial in that, or have we collected any data around delirium? Uh, no. We, we initially did plan to perform a delirium sub-study, but just... Uh, we felt the complexity would have uh, maybe hindered the trial. Uh, and it's an important question. And again, there's biological plausibility underlying it. Um, we do have a sleep sub-study planned. Richard Halliwell and Westmead is going to plan, is going to perform that uh, analysis. And I think that's actually going to be quite intriguing because um, anecdotally, when we ran our, a couple of our pilot studies, and I was a, I was a volunteer in one of our pilot studies, um, those of us that received a dose of dexamethasone struggled 
to sleep for about three days. Certainly my research coordinator said that she went home and she cleaned the house three times over and, and then started, go she just couldn't sleep. So I do think that it potentially has a, an effect on, on the central nervous system, uh, which hopefully the sleep subsidy will identify. And there is, uh, as you know, um, a study planned, I think it's the STRAD trial, examining the use of dexamethasone to reduce delirium in patients undergoing uh, fractured neck of femur surgery. Okay, so that's another trial by another group. Um, some surgeons, uh, in fact, probably other clinicians, are not so concerned about superficial surgical site infection. Do you think the, the uh, outcome data for deep surgical site infection, which is obviously more problematic, more costly, much more associated with, with serious patient harm, is the data equally consistent in the deep surgical site infection group um, when compared with, say, the overall effect? Yes, it is, although obviously it's, it's a much smaller group, um, but it, it's a consistent effect across all the groups. So entirely uh, consistent, yeah. no interaction or, if, or differential no. effect. Across. And it's very reassuring because I think, you know, I, I empathise with surgeons because they very much own their complications. And if you've got an orthopaedic surgeon who takes a patient back for five washouts, takes out a joint, puts a spacer in, it's a massive imposition for the patient in particular. And, and we know that surgical site infections appear to have an influence on long-term outcome about five years down the line. Um, so even a superficial one is not an innocuous event, but the deep ones, the organ space infections are really concerning. And it's reassuring that, uh, that the data is consistent. Okay. Have you got any specific data about delayed wound healing or wound breakdown? Uh, no, no. Well, we do, we have collected data, um, but we haven't analyzed it as of yet. Okay. But as far as you're aware, no, no adverse signal that you're aware of? No, no. Okay. So... Um, you did mention towards the end that there was this statistically significant effect um, or difference with a signal suggesting increased chronic post-surgical pain. This seems to me unexpected. How would you interpret that result and what should happen now? Um, it would be great if the results of trials were straightforward. Um, there always seems to be a curveball that comes out of a uh, left field in particularly when you have secondary and tertiary endpoints. So first of all, it's a secondary endpoint uh, and the p-value around that, uh, as an indicator, was not corrected for multiplicity. Uh, and it will be the subject of a, a further detailed interrogation. We have a sub-study planned to look at that data uh, and that will give us much greater fidelity uh, around that result. Nonetheless, it doesn't seem to make sense to me. Um, you know, neuroinflammation is considered to contribute to chronic post-surgical pain. Uh, and as a potent anti-inflammatory agent, which is lipophilic and does have central nervous system effects, I would have expected a, a contrary result. So it does surprise me, uh, and I can't account for it. I just can't explain it. So it does, I guess, from, from my point of view, given there was a, an analgesic benefit after 24 hours after surgery, which has been shown by others, so again, consistent finding, and there's generally a correlation between acute pain and chronic post-surgical pain, and that seems not to be the case in these data. So much more likely to be a spurious finding. Yeah, I mean, it could just be a type 1 error. Um, although, I mean, the, the benefit, the acute post-operative benefit was only a one point on the 11-point scale out of 24 hours, so it's a very small difference. Um, and in fact, some of the... Uh, studies and some of the other work that we're doing, for example, the lollipop study, which we're about to start, suggests that patients with breast surgery are an example of patients who don't have particularly severe post-operative pain, but do have a very high risk of chronic post-surgical pain. So uh, there, there is a disconnect between the two in some patients. Uh, and again, that may be what's happened here. I might just follow it up with Alan Ching. I know you're an epidemic, trained epidemiologist as well. If you were on a drug advisory board and you saw this p-value of 0 0.006 with uh, 10 to 20 secondary or tertiary endpoints, how would you interpret, interpret that? <laughs> oh, look, that would be difficult. I think for a secondary endpoint, um, you couldn't really um, uh, say that uh, that's a conclusive result, but um, equally, it's a a signal for harm. Um, so it would, you know, for drug regulators, it would be something that you would want to keep an eye on um, in post-marketing work. And so uh, I think that's more studies are required in, in that to understand that a bit more. So obviously a, a, a potentially clinically important 
difference that needs to be further investigated. And Thomas, you're suggesting that such extra data has also been collected in the paddy trial and that will be uh, analysed and reported later this year. Yeah, I mean, it's a 23% um, increase in risk, um, obviously with a wide conference interval around that. But, um, and I know you don't like fragility indices, but I did calculate an informal fragility index around that and it is 18. So it is kind of creeping up towards what would be considered to be pretty robust. So it is concerning, but, you know, as as you've indicated and Alan has indicated, it, with the number of analyses that we've performed, the chances of an erroneous finding of this nature is relatively high. Okay, now I really ask all three of you now, uh, and it's a loaded question, the point estimate and 95% confidence interval of the, of the, the primary finding uh, just crossed the zero difference boundary by a very small amount, 0.3%, um, percent, as I recall. C can you actually um, conclude that, in fact, dexamethasone really decreased the risk of surgical site infection? In other words, not only was it non-inferior, but it was superior. So I'd, I'd say no, um, and partly because the um, as-treated group um, was um, right on the zero mark, and that suggests that it, it, it can be the, because when you look at um, modified intention to treat groups, they are, tend to be anti-conservative, and the as-treated group actually is more conservative uh, analysis. Um, in a non-inferiority trial. So I would say that there probably isn't going to be an effect, but it is a bit intriguing and um, it does, some again, another thing that probably um, in warrants a little bit more dissection of the data to see if, uh, and looking at the other data to see if that might be true. Uh, it would have been a fantastic finding, uh, <laughs> um, but it would have been a more difficult one to explain, I think. Um, and, and I agree with Alan. It, it, um, it seems implausible. Uh, and, and bear in mind that the protocol breaches, um, and I didn't mention this in detail during the talk, but it's fascinating the type of practice you uncover when you run these trials. So the vast majority of the breaches were due to surgical teams giving one or multiple doses of a glucocorticoid, usually dexamethasone, but in some cases hydrocortisone or methylprednisone for wound-related issues such as swelling, pain, redness. That was their go-to treatment. And 6% is, is relatively high. Uh, so, and that's why I think the as-treated um, analysis may not be as straightforward as well, because simply within that crossover group, it wasn't just a single dose, it was multiple doses over several days. So just to put that in simple terms, that was, that's a, effectively a non-randomised comparison, an as-treated comparison, and, and the reason that some people got steroids in the post-operative period could have been directly correlated with surgical site infection. So that's, I guess, there's some um, you know, confounding going on that's so difficult to actually properly understand. So... Uh, Certainly some biostatisticians um, will always rely most heavily on the intention to treat population because it is the purest. Uh, Trish, have you got a view on that? I mean, you seem like a positive person. I mean, <laughs> you, 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 would clear, you, you would clearly expect that clearly reduce the surgical site infection. Is that too much of a push? It's probably, uh, it's, as Alan said, interesting, but I think uh, I can't quite explain why that would be. Um, an issue from a biological um, point of view. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's a, it's a fascinating finding, but I don't think I'd be rushing in to, to give patients dexamethasone purely for prevention of surgical site infection. Right. So that's a very important uh, conclusion, really. So I think uh, the take-home message is uh, a clear demonstration of non-inferiority or dexamethasone is just as safe as not using steroid in terms of surgical site infection, but you simply cannot there conclude that it actually reduces surgical site infection. That's a different question. It was not the hypothesis. Uh, I might finish up there and um, really finish really by congratulating you, Thomas, on leading this wonderful trial. Thanks again. Uh, and for all of you online and, and here in the audience, thank you very much for attending. I hope it's been very beneficial. And, and uh, as Thomas uh, highlighted at the end of his talk, the full paper should now be available on the New England Journal website. 
Uh, and if you like, there's a podcast uh, with a conversation with Thomas and I available on the Monash Perioperative Medicine website. Thanks again, and uh, that's the end of the meeting.